Welcome to the Austin Chronicle May 2021 election forums. I'm Mike Clark Madison, news editor and columnist at the Austin Chronicle. And I'll be moderating discussions with advocates for and against some of the propositions that are on the ballot for this special city election. There are eight in total, propositions A through H. And all but one are citizen initiatives that were placed on the ballot after their supporters gathered signatures from at least 20,000 Austin voters. I'll be asking questions on behalf of the Chronicle editorial board as well as our readers. The Chronicle's own endorsements will be appearing in our April 16th issue, just in time for early voting, which runs April 19th through 27th. Election day is Saturday, May 1st. You can find out everything you need to know before you go to the polls at austinchronicle.com slash elections. For this session, we're taking a look at Proposition B, and I'll be reading you that ballot language right now. <clears throat> Proposition B, shall an ordinance be adopted that will create a criminal offense and a penalty for sitting or lying down on a public sidewalk or sleeping outdoors in and near the downtown area and the area around the University of Texas campus? Create a criminal offense and penalty for solicitation, defined as requesting money or another thing of value at specific hours and locations or for solicitation in a public area that is deemed aggressive in manner create a criminal offense and penalty for camping in any public area not designated by the Parks and Recreation Department. So that's what you probably have in shorthand heard as camping ban. Um, it is a or citizen initiative ordinance that would largely restore uh, what was Austin City Code until uh, the middle of 2019, July 2019, June 2019, uh, when the city council rolled a lot of this back in an effort to what advocates would describe as decriminalizing homelessness. So uh, I will let the advocates introduce themselves. We have uh, Cleo Perchcheck. Patricic. Uh huh. Patricic. Sorry. Um, who is representing Save Austin Now, which is the group that uh, put this initiative on the ballot. And then Chris Harris from Just Liberty and a coalition of organizations that is the no on prop the uh, Homes Not Handcuffs. Yeah, I'm, I'm just here for Homes Not Handcuffs, not, not, not Social Handcuffs. Just Liberty. Yep. All right. Okay. All right. So starting with Cleo, why did we put this on the ballot? Um, well, I got started with this uh, with another group that I was a part of, Safe Project, because I was noticing uh, about 10 minutes away from here, uh, predominantly low-income Hispanic community that was being uh, constantly uh, uh, victimized. There was a lot of encampments that were in that area, and I felt like no one was speaking out for them. And uh, I'm Mexican-American, so I counseled, I contacted our uh city council representatives for these districts and Kitchen and Renteria. I organized several community meetings in English and Spanish, and they failed to attend several meetings. Um, but if they would have attended, they would have heard the uh, outcry from children, teachers, uh, parents that were seeing the things that no children should see. You know, you know, it shouldn't happen in any part of Austin, but it seemed like this community was being ignored. So I've made it my mission as a mom, I just feel like I need to speak out for all kids, you know, and make sure that all communities are safe. Um, and, you know, something that the, this, the opposition, the, the, the claim makes is that Proposition B does nothing but take us backwards. You know, Chris is gonna say that in a little bit. Uh, drive around Austin. Did the decision in June, 2019 take us forward? I don't think so. The opposition tells us what they have been advocating for housing for years, yet in 2019, what they gave us was something that had nothing to do with housing. Now they would like to continue this failed policy with no end in sight. Notice there is no one telling us any timeline associated with the solution. That's because there isn't a credible plan. Proposition B does not take away the right to camp. It forces the city to select safe locations for them to camp and that is going forward. The, the, let's talk about uh, the opposition again. About is the opposition is happy with the way things are. They have no concern for families and communities impacted by the current state of affairs. 
they turned to fear mongering, mongering. In fact, all day yesterday on the news, that's what was happening, fear mongering, about forcing people back into the woods, which is nonsense. Chris Harris says that's another thing that will be brought up. The, the city has the ability to designate locations for camping that aren't in the woods. Could it be that the city doesn't want to give up any of Austin's expensive real estate for safe campgrounds that homeless providers will finally be able to locate homeless and provide services to them? The mayor has made a decision that it is better to let citizens and predominantly, predominantly citizens of color and working class, low income neighborhoods, let them suffer, take the chaos, loss of amenities, loss of park access, but whatever you do, don't give up any of the fancy real estate to give homeless an option other than going into the woods. That is weak leadership. It's amazing that after years of advocacy by this opposition, the best they have to offer is disruptive camping and chaos. The latest fire at Buford Tower is a shining example of the willingness to employ nonsense. The mayor, instead of reassuring Austin that he will work to keep people, including the homeless, safe, simply resorts to trying to scare people by suggesting that the only alternative to what we see today is pushing people to the woods. It is rhetorical fear mongering. There is zero evidence the homeless growth is people who left the woods. In fact, they are still in the woods and every organization has reported on this. The numbers show 20% left shelters when they deregulated camping, not the woods. The existence of Proposition B alone is creating action that should have been taken, should have taken before reaching this crisis point. This indicates a failed failure of leadership in the absence of citizen anger and desperation. Chris Harris will tell you that Proposition B does not offer a solution and that is categorically false. Its very existence has forced change in action. We have acknowledged the crime we are enabling by simply permitting their existence. These encampments have become chaotic and dangerous, place where assaults and other criminal activity flourish. The regulation of camping, if enforced, would immediately end the chaos, disruption and encroachment on public spaces. And that alone is a solution. Prop B passing will send a clear message. Moving forward, because we wanna move forward, the city council must consult with its residents. Citizens want to be involved in the decisions that impact their lives and their neighborhoods. And that's why this proposition had 2,600 signatures. There was overwhelming support. Even in a pandemic, we were able to get certified signatures in a limited time frame. The city council has the tools to make this better now, and they refuse. Retrofitting hotels and making them ADA compliant will take years. Even the city council admits this. City council members like Natasha Harris lose credibility when they say Austin is not worse off. It is plain for all to see how bad it is. And Councilman Harris tells, tell, well, should tell that to the homeless women victimized, sex trafficked in these encampments, that they are not worse off in these unregulated encampments. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Clea. And just to clarify for the for viewers, 26,000 signatures were submitted yes. to- I'm sorry, but, you're right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Proposition Beyond the Ballot. Yeah, thank All you. All right, Chris Harris, so. Sure, and also the councilwoman is, is Harper Madison, not oh, Harris. Yeah. I yeah. understand it's easy to get confused. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity. So, um, we are opposed to Proposition B uh, because not only does it reinstate three ordinances that existed uh, prior to June of 2019, it actually expands them. And we oppose them uh, for the same three reasons. We oppose Prop B for the same three reasons that we opposed uh, and, and advocated for decriminalizing homelessness uh, because it, it writes a wrong. So um, one, we believe that these ordinances are inhumane. Um, by virtue of, if you read the letter of it, criminalizing the act of sleeping outside by having any possessions with you, it criminalizes people's status as being homeless itself. Meaning that someone without shelter, uh, someone without access to shelter or housing unavoidably will be breaking the law each and every night because they have to sleep outside and they're going to have possessions with them. So. Literally, this ordinance makes it illegal to be homeless in our city. And we believe that that's wrong. We think unavoidable behaviors associated with a status that people 
have no choice in, uh, ultimately they're forced into homelessness, um, is wrong. And it shouldn't be the actions of our city, of our state, uh, of any level of government to pick out a, a, a type of person based on an unavoidable status and criminalize their unavoidable behaviors and make their very existence against the law. It's wrong. So that's one. Two is that these ordinances are illogical. Um, the city auditor did a report uh, on these ordinances uh, back in 2017, uh, examining them, and they found that they create barriers to people experiencing homelessness actually getting out of homelessness. So if we want to make homelessness worse, passing Prop B is a good way to do it. How it creates those barriers is that uh, these tickets, which prior to the ordinances being rolled back, were handed out in the thousands annually, overwhelmingly, because these are people in extreme poverty, they cannot pay these tickets, they, these tickets turn into warrants. When you have a warrant, you're unable to get an ID, you're unable to get a driver's license. Uh, guess what else you can't get without an ID or a driver's license? You can't get housing, you can't get, um, you can't get employment, okay? And then these warrants, uh, inevitably, because again, we've criminalized people's very existence uh, by virtue of these ordinances. Uh, so they're going to have additional police in encounters, um, which means that they're going to lead to arrests. And so now we're going to put people into a cycle of jail and homelessness, um, which in addition to making people's problems worse, and we, we can't arrest everyone experiencing homelessness, nor should we. Um, so when they're inevitably released, they'll be released back into homelessness, but now worse off, uh, typically with all or most of their possessions gone, including their essential documents. Uh, if they were accessing any form of treatment or care, that, that was interrupted. So they're in worse shape in that respect as well. Um, and now they also have a criminal history and that criminal history is gonna create an additional barrier to getting housing, to getting a job. So these ordinances uh, actually keep people homeless longer um, and that's how they worked and that's how they'll work again uh, if they're reinstated. And so they're completely illogical. And the third thing is that um, they're very likely unconstitutional. Uh, so, so they're, I think they're going to create real legal issues for the city um, as various iterations of these ordinances have in the past. There was a decision in 2017, Martin v. Boise, uh, whereby um, the city of Boise had an outdoor sleeping ban. It was found that that ban, because of the lack of shelter space, um, violated the U.S. Constitution Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Okay, so the very type of ban they're trying to reinstate here was deemed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals cruel and unusual punishment and illegal under the law. We've similarly seen uh, ordinances pro uh, prohibiting <clears throat> uh, solicitation, otherwise known as panhandling, found unconstitutional in city after city uh, because we know that these get enforced. Um, in um, uh, discriminatory ways. Uh, firefighter groups, church groups, school groups are allowed to panhandle on the side of the road. People experiencing homelessness are largely targeted under these ordinances. And so again, these three, these three ordinances, not just the camping ban, outlawing both uh, sleeping outside, sitting and lying down in the, in the downtown and now campus region and solicitation uh, in the downtown and campus region uh, are, are inhumane, illogical, and illegal. And so for those reasons, uh, we oppose them. Now, to the point of this isn't a solution. I work in criminal justice. I pursued this because I and my colleagues, my fellow organizers at grassroots leadership were approached by a group of people experiencing homelessness and formerly experiencing homelessness who were part of a theater troupe called Gathering Ground. They were about to put on a play called No Sit, No Lie. And they asked us, they, firstly, they communicated to us that these ordinances were oppressive to them, that they hurt them, that they hurt their stability, they hurt their mental health, they hurt their opportunities to get jobs and, and, and housing. And they asked for our help in curtailing or repealing these ordinances 
to undo that oppression. Um, this was not a housing strategy. Uh, and and we, we understood that and fully know that. Uh, it was about righting a wrong. Uh, the Austin version of these ordinances, um, while there are other cities that have similar things, the Austin versions and the versions that uh, Prop B would reinstate are particularly cruel in certain ways. And it's really important that we as a city um, don't reinstate that wrong. And it's also really important that we understand that people experiencing homelessness are part of this community. Their safety and well being, their uh, 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 access to public goods, institutions, those are, should be the same as everyone else. Um, and we agree that it's really uh, unfortunate that so many people are, are homeless in our community. We think that this is. Uh, uh, you know, a, a horrible wrong as well. Um, and we also see that by highlighting it, by it being now more visible, there's been more action on this issue in the last two years than there was in many years prior. And so by passing Prop B, we're actually going to return to a state where we were not addressing this issue. We were not building any new housing or shelter. Uh, and whereas right now with homeless decriminalization, we are moving in that direction. So passing Prop B threatens that. And that's why we're opposed. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I did. I did let you run a little long there, but we'll catch up. Sorry about that. that. That's <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be asking questions back and forth and allowing you to respond to each other as well as me asking questions. So we'll have a flow back and forth here for about the next 30 minutes. Uh, starting with Cleo. Um, Homelessness, of course, is a really complicated issue or, you know, has proved to be a complicated issue for many cities. Austin is not unique in this. What, just sort of narrowing this down to what about reintroducing policing to the solution for homelessness, making criminal offenses, as I know that there has been some resistance on part of the state of Austin now to wanting to you know, lead with, the, there was objection to the ballot language that says criminal offense over and over and over, but it, they are criminal offenses. What about making this a police matter helps solve the community question of homelessness? Right. So, uh Again, what you heard again from Chris Harris and his group is morphine fear mongering. We had 98% compliance before this, the, the ban was lifted. Okay. Uh, also, he brought up the, uh, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, this is another thing that has really frustrated me is that um, two years ago when I begged uh, uh, the mayor in his office to find camp locations that were safe in 110 degree heat, they, sh they push them onto under bridges in, in harm's way, instead of finding toilets, uh, safe areas for them where they can store their, their belongings, they decided that, you know, they're not gonna do that, okay? So he, he admitted that that was a possibility, but once he did that, you know, you can't take it away. I mean, that's a terrible decision and weak leadership for the mayor to have done that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a former probation officer and I've worked in social service my entire adult life. I grew up in one of the lowest income areas in, in South Dallas. My best friend was shot and killed in front of me. Okay, so this is something that is very important to me and very dear to my heart too. Okay, so mm -hmm. we, what, let, let's see, let, why we are following suit of what failed cities have done and, and then longer, have a longer track record of doing what, lifting the camping ban. Uh, they've spent millions up to almost now a billion dollars on this where the city council is heading and have have nothing to show for it. OK, let's 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 look at people that actually have been successful, like the president of Haven for Hope that came the most successful homeless provider in San Antonio who testified at the Capitol last week. And he 
absolutely supports the camping ban. He indicated that having unregulated camp camping enables homeless. Homeless have said to him, why would I go to a shelter when food is brought to me and I can do whatever I want? This is not anecdotal as the statement reports. The 2019 policy changes have left an unmistakable incentive for homeless individuals to, to leave their shelters and live on the streets and parks of Austin. After the policy was instituted, the sheltered count decreased 20%, while the unsheltered count increased 45% in just one year. Okay, so this, 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 whole, every, this all has to do with compliance. OK, and Chris will talk about and his group have talked about, you know, we, we need to be good neighbors. These are our neighbors. OK, however, that does not entail supporting disruptive and unsafe behavior and overwhelming our police and fire organizations with nonstop fires and crime. They appear to believe any requirements of the homeless organization is off limits. Um, the city council gives the impression that the police have little to do with this solution. They basically have given the police and fire a game of whack-a-mole with no proposed solution to make it better. If homes not handcuffs would like for the homeless to be seen, that's fine. And since they have the council's ear, first identify where it is safe for them to be instead of supporting a situation that encourages unsafe and unsanitary uh, living conditions. There is no disagreement that the city of Austin should provide housing and camping locations for homeless. This ballot is about the homeless, what the homeless are doing right now. Should they be allowed to live in disruptive uh, filth and squalor, uh, disrupting the public good or not? There is no disagreement in what should happen in the long run or what the city should have done two years ago, but that's not what this ballot initiative is about. We have no disagreement about what the city should do. Chris has made his career choice to advocate for people that should be able to disrupt the public good, should be able to live in filth and squalor. I've made a choice to advocate for kids like 10 year old Amelia, who's pleading our state representatives to do something about, the communi about her community that is no longer safe. I encourage all to watch her testimony at the Capitol this past Thursday. These, these are people who have had their lives upended because the city of Austin chose to allow people to live in ways that infringe on their schoolyards, leaving paraphernalia behind, committing illicit acts in public. Even the city admits their plan isn't working. It's not fair that kids and communities uh, should have to live this way. And everyone should be advocating for better environments for all, uh, the homeless and the communities surrounding it. This ballot initiative, initiative initiative reinstates our laws on public space camping. It reverses the deregulation that ha has caused so much filth and squalor around our city and the takeover of our parks and trails by encampments. The sanctioned pet grounds are already funded and functional, including one set up by the state of Texas with sanitation and security. Non-compliers are certainly going to be made to leave the areas they're sleeping in now. The public spaces that we all cherish and don't believe should be permanent encampments. However, as we know from history, noncompliance is not rampant when the law is on the books. Compelling people to seek services, shelter, and forcing the city to find safe sanctioned campgrounds is what this is about. Uh, and I'm going to keep going back to this. It's, it's the compliance issue for me. They can go to homeless shelters, transitional housing, the state campground, and I'm begging for city campgrounds, nonprofit facilities. The answer is for the city to spend 73 million annually efficiently to produce homeless housing ASAP. They shouldn't be living in this type of condition with, with no end in sight. That's, that's not right to do that for them. And anyone who advocates for homeless should be demanding that there should be solutions right now. There should be more sanctioned cities campgrounds. I, I really believe that. Uh, not only I, but I mean, the majority of Austin believes this. Can, can um, I jump in here? What, what's the protocol? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Sorry I, about I, that. That's okay. no, it's, yeah, Thank I mean, you. a couple of things, the, you know, I, one, there's, there's simply not enough places for people to go, uh, with sheltered or unsheltered. There simply are not enough places. That's, uh, been a true condition. That said, there have been more places developed. There's been more permanent supportive housing developed. There's been more, uh, uh, opportunities for for, for, uh, for people since decriminalization went into effect. Now, again, decriminalization was not intended as a housing program. It was intended to right a wrong, which it has done. But what it's also done has, bring, has been to bring attention to this issue, which has spurred action. 
action which is now threatened by the possibility that this will be hidden away. And let's make no mistake, that's the intention of this group. It's not to help people. Uh, this, these ordinances we know will hurt people. Uh, what, it, what it was gonna do is they're, they're trying to hide people away. Um, the issue about why there's not enough places for people to go, why aren't there more shelters? Why aren't there city uh, uh, campgrounds? It's because uh, the organizations that are putting forward Prop B are the same organizations that fight every shelter that gets proposed, that fight any attempt to set up a, a, a city sanctioned campground. They wouldn't allow it in their neighborhood. They wouldn't allow it near them. So where is it going to go? Uh, the issue is uh, we have to stop othering people. Uh, we can't put all people experiencing homelessness into a bucket. We can't use dehumanizing language and describe them all as filthy. Uh, th this is wrong. Uh, this is just plain wrong. And I, and I think anybody who wants to separate uh, the 10 year old child from someone who's fallen into uh, experiencing homelessness is approaching this from the wrong situation. The, the issue is actually that any of us could end up in that situation. And so we should be advocating uh, for, for policies and solutions that, uh, we, that we would want to apply to us where a, a horrible health catastrophe, which is the number one driver of homelessness, were to happen to us and we couldn't afford it and we ended up on the street. We should be advocating for, for policies where, again, what would we want to happen to us if we lost our jobs? What would we want to happen to us if we were a victim of <clears throat> domestic abuse and had to flee and now we're on the streets with our kids? What would we want to happen to us? And right now, um, what they're pushing for is uh, criminalization <laughs> to, to give folks tickets and make no mistake that it was not 98 percent compliance was in a very small part of town. Uh, the city audit report was clear between 2014 and 2016, over 18,000 tickets were handed out to people experiencing homelessness under these ordinances. 90% of those tickets turned into warrants. And again, the counterproductive barriers that are created by those tickets followed, keeping people homeless. So these are not solutions. Uh, these are actually things that are intended to harm people who are experiencing homelessness, uh, driven by a value set that views them as somebody else, somebody different, not us and not ever could be us. Um, and it's just plain wrong. Um, and, and ultimately, the solution lies in housing, housing which is now being invested in uh, at a rate that it has not been in the past, uh, despite, despite the, the efforts to fight against it by, by groups that are behind Prop B at every turn. Uh, we actually saw 200 units get approved recently uh, in, in terms of permanent supportive housing beds uh, in two different districts. We have another Caritas project for another close to 200 beds that's supposed to come online later this year. This is the momentum created by the situation that we're in and the recognition that we're in a crisis. If we return to these failed ordinances that simply hide the problem away, uh, then we'll lose that momentum. And, and ultimately that's wrong because we'll just allow the problem to persist, if not get worse. Uh, in, in reality, what we have to be doing is not thinking about where can we put folks how can we uh, manage them? But how can we uh, create a system where, again, if, if any of us were to have the worst situation befall us and find ourselves in extreme poverty, what would we want to happen to us? What would we want, uh, what systems of support uh, and care would we want in place? And that's what we ultimately need to be advocating for, not things that punish people. All right. So, Chris. Um, oh, can I, I respond to that? Well, I'm going to pick up with the question to Chris, and then you can respond to that. Okay, thank um, you. So Chris, you know, leaving aside like what should be done for a moment, looking at the status quo right now, I'm at the Chronicle office right now, right out that window, there's a bunch of tents under the bridge. Um, is it, I mean, it seems like what we're hearing is that average Austinites, normal Austinites, look at this and say, this shouldn't be happening. This is intolerable. These conditions should not be allowed to, to continue. What is the response for those who are saying that, yes, in the long-term housing is the solution and is the only solution, but what do we do now? Um, the criminal solution, may, it, if it's not the right one, it is the one that was traditionally done by this city and other cities. 
what would you do now to tell people who don't think of themselves as not having empathy for the homeless or people who are living in homelessness, but don't want to see these conditions continue? Yeah, well, I would say that we actually are at an incredibly um, powerful moment where I think uh, the opportunity to, to house people and house people quickly is actually here. Um, one, there is a summit that's going on right now that includes a lot of the uh, you know, folks in the city that have the deepest pockets, folks from the Downtown Austin Alliance, folks from the Chamber. Um, they're coming forward uh, really intent on, it, it appears, um, addressing this issue and finding long-term solutions and, and actually potentially putting money on the table for that. Secondly, secondly um, through the relief bill that was just passed by the Biden administration, this community, a uh, combination of the city and the county, are, relieve, are receiving somewhere on the order of $450 million. Um, and this money, um, obviously, I, we, we believe a, a, a fair portion should be uh, allocated uh, to immediately addressing uh, the homelessness issue that we have in our city. Uh, and we think that if people uh, are willing to, <laughs> one, advocate for that, for real housing solutions for people, and two, willing to say that it can, it can, that those housing solutions need to be in every part of our city, including my part, <laughs> uh, that we actually are okay with, uh, we understand these are our neighbors, and that with the right support and care that we can all live together harmoniously, safely, uh, and, and house, um, then we can actually address this in, a, in really short order. Uh, and, and I think it's important for folks to know, know that, you know, Austin, um, while the situation is clearly uh, more visible, uh, remains, uh, you know, on, this, on the scale of per capita homelessness, you know, middle of the pack, uh, as far as big cities are concerned, this is not a, a, an unscalable uh, a problem. Uh, we're not, you know, Los Angeles or New York. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do this. We just need to actually invest in the units, support where it's needed for those that need it. And many don't. Many just need a little bit of assistance to get back on their feet. Uh, and we can do this. So, you know, for us, we really want to see, you know, people in, in touch with the city leadership, in touch with the county leadership, which traditionally has not done much on this issue, um, and telling them, hey, that $450 million that you received, a lot of it needs to go to address this issue. You have an opportunity uh, and let's, let's take it. All right, it's clear. What you heard, you, basically you didn't hear any solutions for what we're gonna do right now from Chris because they don't have any, okay? What we've asked and begged for is short-term, uh, not sure, for the, in the short term, but while it will take years to build these long-term facilities, for some that a lot of these homeless individuals do not want to be housed in shelters with rules and compliance and complying with drug treatment mental health, we need to have sanctioned campgrounds. Now he will say that, you know, communities reject this. Well, the outcry is that we're not being involved in the decision. You know, you want to have community buy-in. You're not gonna have that if you're just saying, okay, it's gonna go here, it's gonna go there. And you're consulting with people that have failed. Uh, agencies that are not providing resources to the homeless. Uh, you're asking for them to, uh, you're following suit with agencies that have not been successful. That then That's ridiculous. Consult with agencies and cities that have been successful. That's number one. Number two, consult with the neighborhoods, have them involved and invested. And so you can have community buy-in and you're not having where it's a negative attitude toward homeless individuals. I have housed homeless and refugees families in my home. We all care. This is no argument on who, on who cares the most of, or doesn't care about the homeless individuals. We all care about them. I care that they should not be living in filth and squalor. And yes, I will repeat it again. It is in filth. And no human is filthy. Okay. The living situation is it's, it's filth and squalor and it's, and it's inhumane for them to live this way. Everyone should be advocating for safer areas and under bridges where their fires are compromising the structures, putting them in harm's way and women are being victimized in these tents. Okay, that, that, that I wanted to say. Um, also, uh, he, I'm sorry, I just got uh, off track. Sorry about that. No we need to, 
We need to see aggressive short-term proposals is what I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. from the city that target housing substantial number of people in various types of conditions. We need safe places for people to go who are nonconformist and have no intention of being in traditional housing and housing options for families, individuals who are on hard times and want a dignified place to stay and be back on their feet. The city did not focus on this, on its initial efforts on housing options when it embarked on this failed experiment, and it is an experiment two years ago. It has muddled around with half-baked ideas, and now uh, Ms. Uh, Chris Harris brings up another summit. We, we, we got all the ideas we need. We, we need to be, uh, it needs to be rapid deployment of services. We need to find locations. We need to have communities involved in where we, where we can provide support and have more engagement. Uh, we need to find places to house people uh, and not just in these small numbers that Chris keep bringing up where we're doing all these, you know, playing whack-a-mole and ho helping com uh, homeless communities by small numbers. We need rapid deployment. It is extremely critical. We should not be ignoring the needs of the entire community, including the homeless. Uh, that is what happens when real leadership doesn't exist on an issue and narrowly concerned activism. activism is this is what happens and substituted in its place. You can assume that ignoring the needs of virtually the entire population of Austin is going to end well. Complex problems like this can't be solved this way. Well, I would just quickly rebut that 300 units, you know, the over 300 units that are scheduled to come online this year is not a small number. That's that's almost a fifth of the unsheltered population in our city. Uh, <laughs> so these are these are real impactful solutions. Uh, and what we need is more investment to help them come online more quickly. And we need community buy-in that that they that they support putting, you know, shelters, uh, housing uh, in, in uh, all parts of town uh, so that we can we can actually proceed with these without a fight each and every time. All right. And that's the question I want to ask Cleo next. Um, you know, obviously, I do think that the Save Austin Now Coalition includes people who are not as stereotypically straw man, anti, get the bums out of my neighborhood, I don't wanna see it. But there are people in Austin who are probably not yet ready to say yes to sort of the basic thing that Chris is saying here is that we are going to accommodate people experiencing homelessness, people who are living with, you know, conditions that require their permanent supportive housing in our communities and that they are part of our communities. We're not going to drive them away. We're not gonna send them somewhere else. There are people who aren't ready to do that. There are people who think that this is still a bunch of others, a bunch of people who come here from somewhere else, a bunch of people who have chosen to live rough, sleep rough because they they want to, there are no other factors involved. All of those, you know, stigmas and, and preconceptions, they do exist. How do you respond to those people? Right. So um, there is no disagreement that we have a homeless epidemic. Okay. This is across the country. Uh, there are various reasons, you know, being in social service, we can go on and talk about that, but I'm not going to waste time on that. Uh, but this is also something that the city has, has, manufactured. Okay. We have become a magnet just like other liberal towns and I'm a liberal. Okay. But with this failed policy, we need to look at policies and cities that are, have been successful on this, not follow suit with what other towns that are creating a, a increase in, in, in a homeless, you know, this is not something that's anecdotal, you know, State uh, media publications have reported on this. There, we have become a magnet, and they have not all come from the woods. Okay, we have they have left their shelters, they have left other cities and other states to come here because they feel like they can do whatever they want, and we will provide food and shelter and everything else, which we should. We have a responsibility. Okay, I cannot speak for everyone else in the group. I can't speak for our entire Austin. I can speak for myself. And when I talk to people that I respect and I know are invested in this, we, we have to take care of each other and we have to provide resources. But we also have to acknowledge those who do not want to be housed in a traditional housing. We need to have a plan for that. I beg for, that's another thing that I beg the Mayor Adler for and he doesn't have a plan for that. They will never have a plan for those who do not, who refuse uh, 
to be housed in a, a traditional housing situation. We need to have community buy-in, which is you know, something I'll keep saying again. Um, and you're not going to have that if you're just telling us like the overlord, hey, they're going to go here and they're going to No, you have to have the community engage maybe to be able to volunteer or, or support or provide services. But if you just tell people that they're going to one day out of nowhere, uh, which is why I got involved, Chris will, has brought up. Because this predominantly low income Hispanic community walking distance, they wanted to put a shelter immediately next to a, a, a three predominant 80% Hispanic community that infuriated me and the, no one was this would not happen in Westlake. Okay, this was happening in the low income area and I have a problem with that because they that community was not not consulted city councils I begged for after the fact to come and talk about it. And they ignored it, ignored all my re my requests. So of course, Chris and I should be eye on of this. If you want buy-in, you have to have the community involved in this. And you know, the city obviously at the end of the day will make decisions, but at least have consult consultations and in, in order to have buy-in. That will be a lot more successful than having them live the, the way that they're living in a, in, a, in a negative environment that only uh, festers and, and it gets worse. It doesn't get better if we continue this situation for them. I'll, I'll just yes. respond. You know, the last the last two, you know, uh, hotel projects were in District 7 and District 6. You know, uh, two of the more predominantly white districts in the town. So, I, you know, and, and of course, in, in six in particular, we saw uh, a huge backlash to that. And so we, we really have to overcome uh, some of these dynamics, you know, if we're ever going to have the, the quick solutions that uh, that Prop B supporters uh, claim to want. Um, but, you know, I think what, you know, it's important for me to just say is that there, there are solutions. Uh, this is being done well. The people that consulted the city of Houston, which cut its uh, homeless population by 50%, uh, throughout the 2010s are the people driving the summit currently going on with uh, that includes, you know, all the service providers, uh, again, the, the downtown Austin Alliance, the chamber and a lot of folks from the city, as well as advocacy groups. Um, and we've seen uh, that, you know, places like San Antonio and Haven for Hope not doing as well, uh, particularly compared to Houston that's put in a housing first approach, a model that the city is now in earnest putting forward. So I think again that that the situation that we're in today um, has highlighted uh, the horrible inequality that exists in our city, um, the the lack of affordable housing, and it's painful and it's and it's disturbing. I, I think we all agree with that. Uh, the question is how do we respond? One side wants to respond by criminalizing people, by setting people back, creating additional barriers for them to escape the situation, and the other side wants to say no, let's move forward with real investments in housing uh, and services. And, and, and that's the most humane and best way to approach the situation. And the, the fact is that people experiencing homelessness overwhelmingly agree with this, the service providers agree with this, faith communities at work uh, with, with people experiencing homelessness, all oppose Part B, all of the uh, most prominent local democratic politicians, including the county judge, the district attorney, the mayor, the county party, the county party chair, all oppose Prop B. Um, this is not a solution. Uh, this is harmful. Um, Prop B uh, should be should be voted down. And the last thing I'll say is that in 2018, the UN sent a special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights in the United States in their report. They concluded, quote, homelessness on this scale is far from inevitable and reflects political choices to see the solution as law enforcement rather than adequate and accessible, low cost housing, medical treatment, psychological counseling and job training. That's what Prop B reinstates the focus on law enforcement as a solution to this and the inevitable cost that will come from more police time, more folks in jail that need to be supported, more court costs, um, money that could be used for housing and support services now diverted to those things. So, um, you know, again, it, it's a it's a short sighted effort to hide a problem that we all now see and and don't like. And we agree it's not good. Uh, but this is not a solution. Prop B is not a solution. And, and we urge everyone to vote no. All right. So is there anything else you want to add there in terms of the closing? Yeah. Who? Uh, no, no. Chris. Yeah. Oh. And then you'll yeah. get the last word. 
Yeah, well, I would just say as well that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, personally, you know, uh, confronted with many stories of, <clears throat> of activity that today uh, is actually not allowed underneath the current ordinances. Uh, people don't realize that the ordinances still exist. Uh, they were curtailed significantly such that we don't really see tickets being given out. But the ordinances do still exist and there still is prohibited behavior. Um, for, for some reason, uh, which I cannot, I cannot rightfully speculate on, uh, they're not being enforced today uh, to the letter of the law. And I think what this points to is really the, how unwise it is to rely on the criminal statutes and on law enforcement as an answer to homelessness. It never will be. It can't, it's not now and it won't be even if Prop B passes. And so we should vote against it so that we can spend the resources that we have on things that actually will help. And those are housing and support services. All right, thanks, Tris. All right, Cleo, take us home. Um, so he brought up Houston and you know the reason why Houston has been successful is because they don't have open camping. They have an ability to compel people to seek better, to seek services. That is that is why these agencies are able to be successful. And also, I was at the state capitol. I met with Democratic state senators and representatives, and they are supportive of open. I mean, excuse me, of, of uh, camping ban. You know, they are, are they're open to the idea or support or flat out uh, on the record in support of it. So this idea that you know this is a Republican or Democrat, you know, ultra Republican movement, no. You know, I don't, I'm sorry to say, I don't have that many Republican friends. The majority of my neighbors and are, are Democrats and we all support this camping ban because it does not help them. This enables a behavior that is not encouraging them to seek better, to seek services and, 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 a, and a better, safer place for them. Um, th another thing is that um, this, this supposition that uh, ho homes, the ha homes, not handcuffs, right? That's a false supposition. Simply providing housing does not prevent crime. We have seen such failed attempts at providing housing without appropriate service throughout recent history. South Chicago, the Bronx, South LA, all provided housing first solutions, but rapidly became icons of social failure, riddled with unbridled crime and neglect and are being torn down today. These were, and in some cases are among the most violent and deadly examples of short-sighted, supposedly progressive agendas. We do not need to repeat history. Homes Not Handcuffs has provided, has held to provide any kind of location where camping would be allowed and is supposedly their, and is supposedly their first goal, housing. Uh, instead, this organization wants to perpetuate unsafe housing and even encourage it for reasons I don't even know, but they encourage for, for them to live in this way. And I do not think that they are safe in these type of, in its type of locations. Um, furthermore, um, when the city admitted that this plan wasn't working, this uh, lifting of the camping ban, uh, it was shocking, but obviously, you know, we had no other recourse as a city residents to compel the city to listen to us, you know, besides the, the proposition and having so much and having so being such a, a have making such a great impact in getting so many people to sign it. Uh, everyone knew it, would, it, it wouldn't work. And when they decided to do this, now instead of going back to square one and starting over with the plan, they want to defend this stupid decision and have endless public debate about who or who isn't sensitive enough to the needs of the homeless. When what this is about, whether or not people should be allowed to sit, camp and lie, to infringe on schoolyards, to infringe on public amenities, removed from their use, all because a very small group of people who choose a lifestyle of lawlessness are allowed to do so with the city's consent. This is about voting yes on Proposition B. Now vote yes on Proposition B. It's about whether people should or should not be allowed to camp anywhere and disrupt schoolyards, playgrounds, parks, and sidewalks. Everyone can see what's happening. Even the mayor says it's not working. We all agree we need long-term housing, but for, pe for people in the city, we all know about gentrification. We all know about increasing property taxes and people like teachers who can't afford to live in this community. It's time to focus on real solutions to challenges and put this failed strategy behind us. It's time to vote yes on Proposition B. Thank you, Cleo. All right, and thank you, Chris. And thank you both for all that you're doing for Austin, all of your advocacy over the years and, and all of the ways in which you are involved. It's, Part of the reason that this is one of the best cities to live in in the U.S. Um, a reminder that yes, early voting 
will begin August, uh, April 19th from the 27th. And election day again is Saturday, May 1st. You can find out everything you need to know before you go to the polls at austinchronicle.com slash elections. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.